interacted with the king and his court and how the king interacted with them and how he listened to them in defense of Islam. And it's really a beautiful historical uh, event that we need to know about, especially as we try to explain Islam to others. These companions were so great, so knowledgeable, so passionate about what they are doing that when one of them speaks, in this case, the Abbas, the Negus, who is the emperor of Ethiopia and his court, he started crying. And when he recited Quran, he recited Surah Maryam, he said that the, his entourage, the church clergy, and all his men of state who were surrounding in this court of the king, they did not understand Arabic. And yet when he recited Quran from Surah Maryam, when he was asked about, what do you say about Isa? He said, what we say what Quran says. We started reciting and they all started crying. This is the power of the Book of Allah. It is not because they understood it, it is the power of Quran. It's the miracle. So these are the Abyssinians and they have an interaction with Islam that is very well documented in the books of history. We also have the Abyssinians themselves trying to uh, divert because they were, they saw that there was a lot of trade coming to Mecca because of the pilgrimage. And so they said, well, if we build the main massive church, we may divert pilgrimage away from Mecca. And so they built this church called, they called it Yemeni Kaaba. But they failed because people did not go there. And so Abraha, who was one of their military leaders, he got upset and he vowed to destroy the Kaaba. And so he came with an army that included elephants. First time the Arabs saw an elephant used in war. And so they came to destroy the Kaaba. And we know from Surah Al-Fir, the chapter of the elephant, that's why where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes how he dealt with them by stoning them from uh, burning clay from hell, and that army was destroyed. This is documented also in the course of history. Uh, also, Christians were by the hundreds of thousands, and major tribes include uh, the tribe of Anajjar, Bassan, Ta'if, and others that will come back to us in, uh, as, as we shall uh, go through this. Uh, from a social aspect, the Arabian society was a mix uh, in terms of social relationship of the social uh, strata. Uh, first, there were women that were the nobility, women who happened to be in the class of nobility. They enjoyed an advanced degree of esteem. And in fact, the Arabs, for the sake of a woman, whether she was treated in humiliation or she was maltreated, they could engage into war. And so wars would start because of the treatment of a woman. Peace would settle because of a marriage between a man from this tribe and this tribe who were at war. And so women had, was held at a very high level of honor amongst them. This is the nobility class. And so wars could start or start because of a woman. So this is how uh, it was treated. The family system, of course, was fully patriarchal. So the father or the grandfather in the house is the chief. Uh, marriage contracts, the contract rested in the, in the hands of the woman, legal, legal guardian. And his words were last. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one aspect of society is this calamity of indecency and prostitution, which was rampant. In fact, Aisha radiallahu anha reported that there were four kinds of marriage. One is the one we know today. The second would be a wife you know, who would be sent to live with another man in order to conceive a child for him from that man, whether he liked in him a character or a strength. He would like to have a child, so he sent his wife to live with him until she conceives. And there were two others that were pure prostitution, and it was a heinous activity. 
uh, also they had no limited number of wives. Uh, one could marry two sisters together in the same house. Uh, they would marry the wives of their fathers if they happened to be divorced. Uh, of course, divorce was in the hand of the husband, and women were treated like commodity. Uh, obscenity and adultery prevailed amongst all social classes, except very, very few men that stayed away from it. And they were self-dignified and they preserved themselves. Uh, free women were in much better conditions, and fortunately, female slaves constituted the greatest calamity. It was rampant, it was horrible, it was heinous, the condition of woman if she is not of nobility, especially if she happens to be a slave. And all of this did not bother them. It did not bother them a bit. This is part of their life and they were fine with it. Lastly, something that we need to notice here, because it is important to understand the mercy of Allah on humanity. This issue that they used to bury their females alive, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, declared in the Qur'an, in fact, وَإِذَا بُشِّرَ أَحَدُهُمْ بِالْأُنْثَى If one of them is brought the news of a newborn female child. His face becomes dark and he becomes upset. He tries to hide away from people because of the calamity of this news. And then Allah says, أَيُمْسِكُهُ عَلَى هَوْمٍ Shall he hold her, keep her, make her to grow, and, or shall he hide her beneath the ground? This is the Quran. And so they used to take them and bury them alive. This is the story that Umar reported that he used to cry at. He said, When I dig that grave that she held onto me, my beard and I was trying to shut her down beneath the ground. This is how horrible and this it is. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, we should contrast this with what Islam ordered them to do in very few years, which is when a child is born, female or male, you've got to celebrate and announce <coughs> publicly to slaughter that sheep, make that sacrifice, call people, invite them, and announce to the public, I have got a child, I have got a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now imagine this turn that the society had to take from the point of burying to the point of standing proudly, announcing publicly, and inviting people for a feast. This is the what Islam has done to these people. And we should be grateful and thankful to Allah when anybody asks about Islam. This is one of the stories that we need to keep in mind. What was that society like and what Islam did to it? Likewise, what was this society like in terms of slaves and what they did to them and what the Prophet and what the Sahaba did? It is astonishing. Some of them, one of them, uh, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, radiallahu anhu, he was the wealthiest of the Sahaba. It is said that he, in his life, he had paid for and freed 30,000 slaves. This is Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, alone. Rasulullah who had no riches whatsoever, is reported to have paid for and freed over 60 slaves. And other Sahaba, one by the thousand, and as I mentioned, Abdul Rahman ibn Abdul is 30,000. So there is a lot of work that Islam did to reform this society and to bring it to what Allah wanted it to be. Uh, however, despite all of this, the scholars agree that there is a reason why Allah sent Islam in this society of Mecca and nowhere else. Why did Allah choose this particular society to reveal His book? 
here are some of the great <coughs> praiseworthy virtues that they had. Hospitality. It is said that almost half of their poetry heritage was dedicated to the merits and nobility attached to entertaining one's guests. <coughs> we used to take this highly be very proud of treating the guest, the traveler, the unknown, no relationship. They were very hospitable. Keeping a covenant. It is for an Arab to make a promise was to run into debt. That's how it was. You can you spend your wealth and even yourself in order to keep a promise. Rasulullah by the grace of Allah, he benefited a lot from it. Because despite the fact that they hated him, but he used when he entered into a covenant of protection with one of them, that man used to hold his hand and take him to the Kaaba and say, he is under my protection. You have to go over my body to touch him. And the others, despite the fact that they hated him and they were about to kill him, but because of this, nobody touched him. And when we go to Ta'if, insha'Allah, and uh, we talk about Ta'if and the way he came back from Ta'if when he was rejected, that's how he entered into Kaaba, Mecca back, because they chased him out. And he had to enter under this covenant, under the covenant of somebody else. There is a sense of honor and repudiation of injustice. They used to hate injustice and stand by that which is uh, just and fair. In fact, even when Quraysh, of the leaders of Quraysh imposed an embargo on Rasulullah and his companions and all the Muslims for three years in the valleys of Mecca. A few of them conferred behind the scenes and they talked and they said, this is unjust. We cannot do this. Their children have nothing to eat. They are crying. You can hear their cries. And you have everything to eat and you are clothed and you are sheltered and all over and they are sitting in the valley of, Kaab, of Mecca for three years. And they came down one by one and they tore that agreement that Quraysh imposed to put an embargo on the Prophet and his followers. It's because again, because of this hate toward injustice. The Arabs were firm and determined. When they were decided to do something, they do it. There is no walking back. This is a characteristic that brought the Sahaba to defend Islam. It's in them. That when they had made this pledge to Allah and to His Messenger, there is no walking back. They were patient, perseverant, and they had uh, very good mildness. They had this pure and sim simple Bedouin life, which is untarnished with all the excesses of sedentary and city dwellings, uh, its uh, truthfulness, honesty, and so forth. Uh, let's get to the lineage of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. It is called the family is called the Hashimite, uh, in Bani Hashim. Uh, this tribe is called Bani Hashim, and his lineage is that he is Muhammad. Ibn or Bin, which means the son of Abdullah, the son of Abdul Muttalib, uh, the son of Hashim, the son of Manaf, uh, Usay, and then it goes on tribe by tribe all the way to Adnan. And Adnan goes to Ismail, and Ismail goes to Ibrahim, and then it goes all the way to Adam alayhi salam. That's the lineage. So up to this point, up to Adnan, this is verified by historians, biographers, and genealogists. But beyond Adnan, there is a discussion as to the exact lineage. People have not been able to really uh, trace it very accurately as much as what we see here up to Adnan. Uh, his father was Abdullah. Uh, he was the son of course of Abdul Muttalib. It is said that he was the smartest of the sons of Abdul Muttalib, his grandfather. His mother was Amina, who was also a woman of nobility. She is the daughter of uh, uh, Wahab ibn Abdul Manaf, who is the chief tribe of Bani Zahra. And they had 
great honor attributed to this family. So this is Amina, uh, the, the mother of Muhammad Sallallahu Abdullah and Amina were married in Mecca. And soon after that, Abdullah, the father, went to Medina, or he said that he went on a business journey to Syria. And he died there. He died in Medina on his way back. And so he was buried in Medina, which means Rasulullah was orphaned before he was born. So Rasulullah never knew a father. Uh, 